given human freedom and human uh, stubbornness, some people may go to hell despite God's desire and efforts to save them. Moreover, it's far from obvious that God's being all-loving compels him to prefer a world in which uh, no one goes to hell over a world in which some people do. Suppose that God could create a world in which everyone is freely saved, but there's only one problem. All such worlds have only one person in them. Does God's being all-loving compel him to prefer one of these underpopulated worlds over a world in which multitudes are saved, even though some people freely go to hell? I don't think so. God's being all-loving implies that in any world he creates, he desires and strives for the salvation of every person in that world. But people who would freely reject God's every effort to save them shouldn't be allowed to have some sort of uh, veto power over what worlds God is free to create. Why should the joy and the blessedness of those who would freely accept God's salvation be precluded because of those who would stubbornly and freely reject it? It seems to me that God's being all-loving would at the very most require him to create a world having an optimal balance between saved and lost, a world where as many as possible freely accept salvation and as few as possible freely reject it. Thus, neither of the crucial assumptions made by the opponent of the doctrine of hell is necessarily true. God's being all-powerful and all-loving does not entail that everyone will freely embrace God's salvation or that no one will freely reject it. And thus, no inconsistency has been demonstrated between God and hell. Now, the opponent of the doctrine of hell might admit that given human freedom, God cannot guarantee that everyone will be saved. Some people might freely condemn themselves by rejecting Christ's offer of salvation. But, he might argue, it would be unjust of God to condemn people forever. For even grievous sins, like those of the Nazi torturers in the death camps, still deserve only a finite punishment. Therefore, at most, hell could be a sort of purgatory, uh, lasting an appropriate length of time for each person before that person is released and admitted into heaven. Eventually, hell would be emptied and heaven filled. This is an interesting objection because it argues that hell is incompatible not with God's love, but with his justice. The objection is saying that God is unjust because the punishment doesn't fit the crime. Now, if one finds this objection persuasive, one could avoid it by adopting the doctrine of annihilationism. Some Christians hold that hell is not endless separation from God, but rather the annihilation of the damned. The damned simply cease to exist, whereas the saved are given eternal life. Now, while I'm not of this opinion myself, it does represent one way in which you could blunt the force of this objection. But is the objection itself persuasive? I think not. Number one, the objection equivocates between every sin which we commit and all the sins which we commit. We could agree that every individual sin which a person commits deserves only a finite punishment. But it doesn't follow from this that all of a person's sins, taken together as a whole, deserve only a finite punishment. If a person commits an infinite number of sins, then the sum total of all such sins deserves infinite punishment. Now, of course, nobody commits an infinite number of sins in the earthly life. But what about in the afterlife? Insofar as the inhabitants of hell continue to hate God and reject him, they continue to sin, and so accrue to themselves more guilt and more punishment. In a real sense, then, hell is self-perpetuating. In such a case, every sin has a finite punishment, but because sinning goes on forever, so does the punishment. But secondly, why think that every sin does have only a finite punishment? We could agree that sins like theft, lying, adultery, and so forth 
are only of finite consequence and so only deserve a finite punishment. But in a sense, these sins are not what serves to separate someone from God. For Christ has died for those sins. The penalty for those sins has been paid. One has only to accept Christ as Savior, to be completely free and clean of those sins. But the refusal to accept Christ and his sacrifice seems to be a sin of a different order altogether. For this sin decisively separates one from God and his salvation. To reject Christ is to reject God himself. And this is a sin of infinite gravity and proportion, and therefore deserves infinite punishment. We ought not, therefore, to think of hell primarily as punishment for the array of sins of finite consequence which we have committed, but as the just due for a sin of infinite consequence, namely the rejection of God himself. Third, finally, it's possible that God would permit the damned to leave hell and go to heaven, but that they freely refuse to do so. It's possible that persons in hell grow only more implacable in their hatred of God as time goes on. Rather than repent and ask God for forgiveness, they continue to curse him and reject him. God thus has no choice but to leave them where they are. In such a case, the door to hell is locked as Jean-Paul Sartre said, from the inside. The damned thus choose eternal separation from God. So again, as long as any of these scenarios is even possible, it invalidates the objection that God's perfect justice is incompatible with everlasting separation from God. But perhaps at this point, the opponent of the doctrine of hell can try one last objection. Granted that it is neither unloving nor unjust of God to create a world in which some people freely reject him forever, what about the fate of those who have never heard about Christ? How can God condemn people who, through no fault of their own, never have the opportunity to receive Christ as their Savior? A person's salvation or damnation thus appears to be the result of historical and geographical accident, which is incompatible with an all-loving God. This objection is, however, fallacious because it assumes that those who have never heard about Christ are judged on the same basis as those who have. But the Bible says that the unreached will be judged on a quite different basis than those who have heard the gospel. God will judge the unreached on the basis of their response to his self-revelation in nature and conscience. The Bible says that from the created order alone, all persons can know that a creator God exists and that God has implanted his moral law in the hearts of all persons so that they are held morally accountable to God. Then the Bible promises salvation to anyone who responds affirmatively to this self-revelation of God. Now, this does not mean that they can be saved apart from Christ. Rather, it means that the benefits of Christ's sacrifice can be applied to them without their conscious knowledge of Christ. They would be like people in the Old Testament before Jesus came who had no conscious knowledge of Christ, but who were saved on the basis of his sacrifice through their response to the information that God had revealed to them. And thus, salvation is truly available to all persons at all times. It all depends upon our free response. No Christian likes the doctrine of hell. I truly wish with all my heart that universal salvation was true. But to pretend that people are not sinful and in need of salvation would be as cruel and deceptive as pretending that somebody was healthy even though you knew that he had a fatal disease for which you knew the cure. The issue before us today is not, therefore, whether we like the doctrine of hell. The issue is whether the doctrine is possibly true.